Hey, book lovers. My name is M, and I want to talk about books and cats. Hey, book lovers. Thanks for coming back for another episode of M's Books and Cats podcast. Um, I wanted to thank you so much for bearing with me last week when I was not able to finish my uh, weekly chapter of Heart of the Storm. I think taking a break was a really good idea. And I ended up being much more productive because of it. So stay tuned at the end of the episode for this week, two new chapters of Heart of the Storm. So in random book news, I just read an article um, from The Guardian. It was written by Alison Flood that um, Tolkien's original illustrations are going to be included in a printing of Lord of the Rings for the first time ever. So first time since it was published in 1954. He apparently created illustrations while he was writing to uh, kind of keep the locations fresh in his mind and also just because he enjoyed it. But he was insecure about his artistic abilities because a few of his illustrations had been included in The Hobbit and he was rather crushed by some of the critical comments. I think it's wonderful that his illustrations are finally being um, included in Lord of the Rings. I saw pictures of a couple of them and they're really beautiful. They're not complex, um, but everything's quite pretty. and. Looking at them, you can definitely see the locations in the book. That man was such a creative force. I mean, he made maps, he made a whole world, he created new language, and he also apparently drew whatever was in his mind. Absolutely incredible. If you want to read the whole article, the link is in the show description. Now let's talk about books. So this week I'm going to be covering two different books. The first one is called I'm Watching You, and it's by Teresa Driscoll. Um, And there's a link to it in the show description. This one was interesting. I honestly was not sure that I liked it at first. It was fine, but it seemed a bit jumbled and kind of all over the place, and there were five different points of view. So every chapter, it would be one of those five, but it it was kind of everywhere. Um, There seemed to be too many suspects and characters, and it just felt very messy. But anyway, it starts with an incident on a train. The witness, Ella, is riding into London and notices two men get on, and they're carrying their belongings in trash bags. They've just been released from prison, which they tell a pair of high school girls that they start chatting with. So this is a little off, but Ella's also kind of a prude, and she's absolutely shocked when she hears one pair hooking up in the bathroom of the train a little later. She's concerned, and she thinks about calling the girls' parents, Her eavesdropping has given her enough info where she could figure out who the girl's parents are, but she finally decides to mind her own business and goes on her way. But then the next morning, one of the girls is missing, and it's all over the news. Ella comes forward with what she saw and what she failed to do and faces a backlash that lasts almost a year. Then, just as things seem to be leveling out, she starts receiving threatening letters from someone who is blaming her, and also they seem to know something more about what happened to the girl. And then it goes from there. So after a somewhat jumbled start, things really begin to come together, and the plot begins to move at a frantic pace. This book really came together. It made me gasp, and I cried. Once I settled into it, I could not stop reading it. I loved it. So... If at the beginning you feel like there's a lot going on and it's a little bit messy, that's okay. It's going to get great. So yeah, I'm Watching You by Teresa Driscoll. Check it out. I highly recommend. Now we're going to take a quick break. Hey, book lovers. I don't know if you know this, but my Books and Cats podcast is not my first. I also do the rewriting podcast with my husband, Andy, though right now we're kind of in a revamping process. Anyway, we have a great deal with a company called Double Under Wonder, and I'd like to share it with you. They make personalized jump ropes in fun colors and patterns. 
So if you're looking for a fun, portable, and inexpensive way to exercise, check out Double Under Wonder. The link is in the show description, and you can use code RERUNNING for 10% off your order. If you like reading as much as exercise, which I personally do, or maybe a little less, but still, check out Double Under Wonder and use the code RERUNNING. Get a fun new rope that is uniquely yours with Double Under Wonder. Welcome back, book lovers. So today we are going to talk about a second book, one that I have read numerous times since childhood, and that is The Giver by Lois Lowry. So The Giver was my first dystopian novel, and it had a massive impact on me. I started reading it, and I just had this feeling of like, what is this? This is me. And it persisted in my writing and my reading tastes even until today. I love dystopian books. Lois Lowry is one of my favorites of all time, and this one is my favorite of hers. So let's talk about The Giver. It is a 1993 American young adult dystopian novel, um, and it is set in a society which at first appears to be utopian but is revealed later to be dystopian. The novel follows a 12-year-old boy named Jonas. The society has taken away pain and strife by converting to sameness, a plan that has also eradicated emotional depth from their lives. Jonas is selected to inherit the position of the receiver of memory, who is the person who stores all of the past memories of the time before sameness as there may be times where one must draw upon the wisdom gained from history to aid in the community's decision-making. Jonas struggles with the concepts of all the new emotions and things that are introduced to him, uh, whether they are inherently good or evil or in-between, and whether it is even possible to have one without the other. The community lacks any color, memory, climate, or terrain, all in an effort to preserve the structure, order, and the true sense of equality beyond personal individuality. The Giver won the 1994 Newbery Medal and has sold more than 10 million copies worldwide. That's as of 2014, so I'm guessing it's more than that now. It's on many middle school reading lists, but it's also a frequently challenged book, and it ranked number 11 on the American Library Association's list of the most challenged books of the 1990s. A 2012 survey based in the U.S. designated it the fourth best children's novel of all time. Like I said, it's incredible. So, that brings me to my next project. They made a movie of The Giver that was released in 2014. It was directed by Philip Noyce and starred Jeff Bridges, Brenton Thwaites, Odea Rush, Meryl Streep, Alexander Skarsgård, Katie Holmes, Cameron Monaghan, Taylor Swift, and Emma Tremblay. There's some big names in there. It grossed $67 million, and its budget was $25 million. It also received the People's Choice Award nomination for Favorite Dramatic Movie. However, it has received generally mixed reviews from critics. I didn't even know they were mixed. I thought they were bad. And when I went to Rotten Tomatoes, they have a 35% rating on Rotten Tomatoes. Hmm. So I have avoided this movie because usually when I love a book, especially one that is as momentous for me as The Giver was, I decide to skip the movie version because it just can't compare. There's no way. But for the sake of my Patreon, I've decided to give some of these movie versions of my favorite books a try. And I'm going to film it. So I am starting off with The Giver, and it should be interesting. You can check it all out at patreon.com slash books and cats pod that's books the letter n cats pod um if you want to see my reactions and if you sign up you get all kinds of special patreon members only content so i'm excited about the patreon i think i'm looking forward to watching the movie it's going to be an experience either way we'll see what happens and you can join me on patreon so let's talk about my cats My cats have been up to some shenanigans this week. Strudel especially. We have a door in our house that is incredibly hard to open. Like, you have to 
it rubs on the carpet and it is really hard to push open. You have to really work for it. And she managed to push open this door and also knock a fan out of a window so that she could go outside. Now, there is absolutely no reason that she needed to do that. She is the only cat that we trust outside and we will let her out anytime she wants. She just decided that she had to do it herself. This wasn't even at night, like when everybody's asleep and they won't let her out. This was during the day. We were all around. So shenanigans. That's what I'm saying. Our oldest cat, Zeus, also just got to take another trip outside into the grass the other day. Uh, My oldest brought him out and let him run around. And he got to eat grass and soak up the sun and the fresh air. And he was so excited. He made the happiest little noise as he was running outside. He's so cute. Like, he's so old, but he still just acts like a kitten. It's adorable. Anyway, now it's time for the quote of the week. Um, This one is from one of my favorites, Ernest Hemingway. And I just like it. And honestly, like, this past week has been a rough one for me um, for a lot of reasons. And it just kind of struck a chord. So here it is. The world breaks everyone, and afterward, many are strong at the broken places. I love that quote. It reminds me of the Japanese kintsukuroi, I think is how you say it. Probably not. Um, But it's the idea of when something is broken, they mend it and they use gold at the broken places because it makes it more beautiful, even after it's been broken. And uh, yeah, that's just... That's kind of my vibe this week, so we're going with that. Plus, I love me some Hemingway. So anyway, that is it for this episode. Remember to stick around after the music, and you can hear chapters 14 and 15 of my weekly writing project, Heart of the Storm. I'm making up for missing last week, and things in the story are starting to pick up. It's getting exciting. Um, If you have any book recommendations or funny cat stories or anything, Uh, Send me a message, books.cats.pod, on either Instagram or at Gmail. And if you haven't yet, please head over to iTunes and give the podcast a rating, hopefully five stars. It helps a ton, just with getting seen by more people. I am really just so grateful for you all, book lovers. Um, Thank you so much for listening. And until next time, keep reading. Thanks for sticking around, book lovers. And now, Chapter 14 of Heart of the Storm. Harper watched Ke pacing the living room of the cramped apartment with growing annoyance. He was sweating and panting and muttering under his breath. Every once in a while, he would smack himself in the head. It made Harper jump every time. The sound was loud in the tiny room. Most of her anxiety came from the other girl, the tattooed one. Her markings were beautiful, but they seemed to pain her. They were darker and cleaner than Kez's tattoos, but the imagery was the same. It was unmistakable. Their skin had been marked by the same hand. The girl was staring at Harper. She hadn't taken her eyes off her since Kez tossed them into the stairwell of the rundown apartment building. He'd hustled them up the smelly stairway and into this uncomfortable room, and Harper hadn't immediately noticed the staring. As the hours passed, it was unmistakable. Harper wasn't even sure the girl was blinking. It was odd. Not much compared to what Harper had seen recently, but it was still creepy. Ken noticed it, too. He stepped between them and blocked Harper's view. Stop staring at her. He began to lecture. He didn't get to say any more. There was a strangled, choking sound, and Harper watched in horror as the large man crumpled to the floor, holding his throat and writhing for a moment. Then his body went still, and his iron grip on his own throat loosened. Harper tore her eyes from the unconscious man and looked up. The girl was staring at her again, and she was grinning. Hello, Harper. Her voice was strangely familiar. Harper was certain they'd never met, but the girl's voice stirred something in Harper that she couldn't quite place. How do you know my name? 
Harper fought to keep her voice steady. She feared very little, but this girl made her deeply uncomfortable. The girl laughed. It sent a chill through Harper. Oh, I know everything about you, Harper. More than you know about yourself, even. Harper eyed Kez's motionless body. The girl's shrill laugh made the hair on her arms stand up. He's alive. Barely. She sneered as she stood and moved slowly around the edges of the room. Who are you? How do you know my name? And what else do you claim to know about me? So many questions, the girl growled. Then she threw back her head and laughed. Relax, I'm messing with you. I do know all about you, though. I've been watching you for over a year now. Harper thought back to the many times she'd felt unseen eyes on her and turned to find no one there. She'd always assumed it was one of Mina's henchmen. The woman had first approached her at a carnival. It was Harper's 16th birthday, and also her second date with Ethan, her crush since sixth grade, who had finally asked her out once her chest started filling out the front of her t-shirts. He wasn't quite what she'd imagined, and their first date had been mostly Ethan texting his friends and talking about himself, while Harper sipped a milkshake. His main interests were video games and his beaten-up, sticker-covered acoustic guitar, which he had carried around the school for years and strummed occasionally, but never actually played a song. Harper was hoping for magic that night. Her birthday signified more freedom, and she took it as a good sign that she was beginning her next trip around the sun with a cute date. She hoped for something memorable. Maybe a kiss at the top of the Ferris wheel. Maybe something more. It made her cheeks burn thinking about it. They were double dating with Ethan's friend Jack and his girlfriend Claire. Harper didn't like Claire, and the feeling was mutual. The girls had been enemies since Claire moved to town and immediately started dating Jack. He had been Harper's best friend for a long time. They had grown up together, and everyone had known that Jack loved her. Harper had thought so, too, and she had not been careful. She had used him. She was hurt but not surprised when he jumped at the chance to date the gorgeous new girl. It sent quite a ripple through their small high school. Most of them had grown up in the valley. Claire was one of the few newcomers. It took quite a lot to get the permits to cross the river. Jack wouldn't look at Harper. Claire was all over him, but her eyes drifted over to Harper often. Harper was trying to pretend she didn't notice. Ethan was staring at his phone. Devin and Kevo are over by the Hall of Mirrors, Ethan said, grabbing Harper's hand. Come on. They laughed as they ran across the fairgrounds and dodged kids running wild and harried moms with loaded strollers. Harper felt a rush at the heat of Ethan's hand on hers, and she tried to take it all in. Jack sprinted by with Claire tossed over his shoulder. Harper felt a momentary pang. She missed her friend. She was sorry that she couldn't love him the way he wanted. As if he could read her thoughts, Ethan stopped and pulled her close. Her heart raced at the smell of him. Hey, he whispered. Bet you can't catch me. He pulled away and dashed into the house of mirrors. Devin laughed and high-fived him as he passed. He followed him inside, and Claire and Jack were close behind. Kevo waited for her. They'd only been friends for a year at that point. He had appeared very suddenly in her life. He spoke little and had joined the group as a mostly silent, hulking shadow a year earlier when his mom had finally let him attend the high school. Until then, he'd been taught by a parade of bland, humorless tutors. None of them lasted long. His mother always found something wrong with them, and they would vanish as quickly as they came, replaced by another that was just the same. Harper didn't know any of that on the night of the carnival. She smiled at him as they walked toward the yawning mouth of the House of Mirrors. She could hear the others laughing and calling to each other. Kevo gave her a nervous smile. These places freak me out, he admitted sheepishly. Will you stick with me? Sure, she agreed. She was a little surprised when he grabbed her hand, but it felt natural, like they'd known each other their whole lives. The mirrored maze was disorienting, and the blue-green lights gave everyone an alien-like appearance. Harper saw brief glimpses of her friends' faces, Devin laughing, Ethan waving while Claire clung to his arm, Jack's face falling when he saw her. Then the lights went out. Someone screamed and the room erupted. Kids were running blindly through the maze, crashing into mirrors and screaming. 
The lights came back on, but they were red this time. Clouds of smoke were billowing into the house of mirrors. The ground disappeared in a haze. Look, Keva whispered harshly. A dark figure appeared in the mirrors. Hundreds of shadowy, intimidating figures. Then she stepped into view, and Harper knew this was the real one. Hello, Harper, she said from the shadow of her hood. She threw it back, and Harper laid eyes on Mina for the first time. She'd been a thorn in Harper's side ever since. Her first invitation had been kind. Harper had seriously considered what she was offering. More information on her strange magical abilities. Things her parents, though kind and well-meaning, refused to teach her for some unknown reason. Mina was giving her exactly what she wanted, but it was too exact. It was as if the woman knew her innermost desires and was offering her access to every single one. If Harper hadn't been dazzled by the woman's magnificent presence, she might have noticed the preciseness of the offers. She might have been wary. Unfortunately, she was not. When Mina offered her everything, she agreed and shook the woman's hand. Her grip was strong. It hurt Harper's hand. Mina's hand was cold and somewhat clammy. The handshake was unsettling, and Harper was quick to pull her hand away. Keva was still gripping her other hand. His was warm and soothing. She leaned into him and felt a sense of peace wash over her. She was safe for a moment. But the promise had been made. The house of mirrors plunged into darkness again. Worried voices and cries of panic were growing outside. When the bright fluorescent lights snapped on and brought the room to blinding reality, the horror was unimaginable. Bodies littered the walkways, motionless. Harper would never forget their complete stillness. She'd never seen a dead body before. The realization came to her slowly. Keva waited patiently and continued to hold her hand. His face remained calm and passive. She leaned into his strength, and he lifted her over the mess and out into the fresh air. A couple of carnival workers pushed past them. Harper heard them call out. Sirens sounded in the distance and grew louder as the flashing lights approached. Kevo carried her to the parking lot. They located Ethan's car, and he set her gently on the hood. She wasn't crying, but she couldn't stop shaking. Kevo held her shoulders firmly but gently and waited for her trembling to stop. Harper was finally able to lift her chin and look him in the eye. Ethan? She managed to croak. Kevo looked grim and shook his head. He averted his eyes from her pleading gaze. Harper felt numb. She barely remembered the walk home. They had both arrived with others, and Harper couldn't imagine calling her parents. They would never let her out of the house again. They reached the road that snaked through the trees for miles before joining a highway. Harper's home was miles away from the fairgrounds. She sighed at the thought of the long walk in the dark. Kevo hesitated. Um, he stammered. He jammed his hands into the pockets of his jeans, and he gave her a strange look. Can I show you something? Harper nodded slowly. There was a nervous flutter in her belly. You can't tell anyone. His stare was intense and she was briefly worried. He extended his hand and when she took it, a warm comfort washed over her. She felt safe. Kevo grabbed her and threw her over his shoulder. Harper tried to shriek, but it caught in her throat. The wind was rushing by at an alarming speed. It took her breath away and she struggled for air. A moment later, the wind was gone, and they stood in front of Harper's home. Kevo smiled, gave her a little wave, and walked away with his hands in his pockets. Harper stood frozen in shock and watched him walk away. Magic. Strong magic like hers. She'd been raised to keep it a secret. She'd been told that she was the last. It seemed that was not the case. Harper found Kevo at the Muscle House the next day, and they were inseparable from that moment on. He knew a little more about magic than Harper did and filled her in on what he knew of their history and how to best access and control their abilities. In return, she taught him about the natural magics of her parents and the others in the valley. The common magic of the earth, 
the plants that brought healing, and the ones that caused death. They discussed new findings daily as they worked out and trained in martial arts. They grew strong. They prepared. Harper refused Mina's invitation. She blew off the meeting and started planning how she could best defend herself. She and Kevo had magic of similar strength, but her type was completely foreign to him. He was only able to give her rudimentary magic skills, and she was, therefore, only able to harness a fraction of her powers. She just hoped it was enough when Mina decided to retaliate. After Harper's initial refusal, Mina's requests became much more threatening. Her goons were constantly lurking around, and it was now slowly dawning on Harper that she had seen this girl before. Quite a few times, actually. She got to her feet quickly, but the other girl was quicker. She wrestled Harper to the ground easily. Her strength was shocking. The girl laughed. She had bound Harper's hands with a scarf she pulled from her pocket and sat on her legs, pinning them down. Harper didn't struggle. She was afraid. She had no idea what kind of magic she was dealing with, but it was strong. Not normal valley magic. The girl leaned forward and examined Harper's face. She kept very still and made passive eye contact with the tattooed girl currently crushing her legs. She waited and tried to breathe evenly. You're not going to run? The girl asked, raising one eyebrow. Harper shook her head silently. The girl seemed satisfied. She shifted her weight painfully. Harper winced, but the girl ignored her. She hauled her up and brought her back to her original place in the room. Ke was snoring now. His face was slack with sleep, and he looked gentle, harmless, for now. The girl followed Harper's gaze and frowned. Don't pity this guy. He's got poison in his veins. No good will come to him. She paused briefly. Or anyone bearing the marks of eternal death. The girl's eyes remained steadily trained on Kez's sleeping form. She narrowed them after a moment and shook her head. Right, so, Harper, it's nice to finally meet you. You've been following me. As soon as she said it, Harper was certain it was true. She thought back. For over a year, she said. The girl nodded. Almost two years now, she agreed. You saw me, huh? I thought I was being sneaky. She put a hand to the back of her neck and her sleeve fell down, exposing more markings. Dark, fresh, and incredibly deadly. Her smile wavered. I guess if I'd been better at hiding, he wouldn't have caught me. Her voice was softer now, sadder. And Kiki, too. I really am bad at this. She tried to make the last part a joke. Harper tried to smile in return. There was a crushing heaviness all around them, and both girls felt it keenly. So why were you following me? Harper asked gently. Oh, lots of reasons the girl said with forced amusement. I was paid to, Mina made me, and... So you are one of Mina's, Harper interjected. The girl wrinkled her nose. Not really. There are a lot of people looking for you, Harper. Why? The girl rolled her eyes. Again, lots of reasons. You're apparently very powerful and very important. Why were you following me? Harper asked again. The real reason. Your reason. The girl nodded. Okay, sure. First of all, my name is Gemma. I don't work for Mina, but she does know who I am. She's probably the cause of these marks. Gemma paused for a moment and laughed ruefully. Of course she is, she mumbled to herself. Harper was momentarily forgotten. She cleared her throat. And your reason? Harper asked again. Why have you been following me? Gemma shrugged, but her eyes glistened with tears. I wanted to know more about my little sister. Chapter 15 The library of Mina's palace was a dusty, forgotten space. She had no interest in books and found reading dull. Books held no information that mattered to her, and she let the room fall into disrepair. Francie wrinkled her nose as she stepped through the creaky doorway and led Lottie and Maz into the dusty book cemetery. The light came from a single golden bulb near the back of the room. Glittering particles danced lazily in the glow, and swirled with the sudden movement of new air entering the room. 
Here we are, Francie said. Distaste was plain on her face, and she kept her hands clenched in front of her and close to her body, unwilling to let the dust settle on her. Well, Lottie asked irritably, what's Mina left for us? All of the information you could ever need, Francie replied. Her eyes drifted over the repulsive stacks, and she moved with surprising swiftness out the door and swung it shut with a bang. Oh, are you kidding me? Lottie stomped her foot in exasperation, sending a cloud of dust into the air, and doubling over a moment later, choking and sputtering as the dust entered her lungs. Maz pounded on her back and found a chair for Lottie to sit down. The coughing was getting worse, and Lottie couldn't control it. Her earrings swung and glittered in the dim light as she bent forward and put her head between her knees. Her body was racked with another terrible cough, and then something soft and gelatinous emerged. It was the size and shape of a jellyfish, and glowed with a pale purple light. Maz stared in horror as it pulsed on the floor at their feet. Is that? Lottie lifted her head groggily. Of course, she said in a raspy voice. Her skin had gone pale and seemed to shrivel as Maz watched. She leaned back in her chair and locked eyes with Maz. You need to get out, she croaked. Maz nodded, but they hesitated. I'm sorry, they began. Lottie pointed an angry, bone-thin finger toward the door. Maz nodded again, and this time they moved to the door and pulled hard, expecting the door to be locked. Instead, it swung open with ease and knocked Maz off balance. As their eyes adjusted to the bright light beyond the doorway, Maz saw a hand coming toward their face, and then a bright flash, and finally darkness. Francie stood over the unmoving form in the doorway and sighed. She took the thin, pale arms and tugged. Maz was lighter than expected. Francie smiled. It was still a hassle that one had not immediately succumbed to the dust, but she knew an opportunity when she saw one. She had a chance to change the game, and so far no one else had any idea. Kevo was sprinting down a muddy road. It was dark and he stumbled blindly over rocks and holes. His shoes slipped in the mud. He was somewhere on the outskirts of the valley, near the forests and unnervingly close to the bridge. In fact, the road had begun to dip, moving toward the river, and he knew that meant the bridge was getting closer with each step. Not that he had a choice. He had to keep running, as fast as he could, because if not... His thought was cut short by the sound of a revving motor and the splash of headlights. Kevo tried to pick up the pace, but his feet were slipping, and a sharp pain stabbed at his side. The car was bearing down on him. The horn blared. Kevo tripped and tumbled face first into the mud. He knew it was over. He turned to face the headlights. He closed his eyes and waited. Harper didn't know what to say. She sat frozen in place staring at Gemma with wide eyes that were not really focused on anything. Gemma waited for a bit, but when she realized it was going to take a while, she went out to Lottie's store and brought back provisions. Harper was in the same place when Gemma returned. Okay, sis, she said irritably. Time to snap out of it. We don't have time for this. She snapped her fingers in front of Harper's face, and on the third snap, the girl's eyes closed slowly. When they opened again, she was back in the room seeing Gemma, and beginning to understand that it was all actually real. Sister, she said slowly. Yeah, don't get hung up on it. No time. We've got to get to the forest in the east. We'll be safe there. Safer, anyway. Gemma looked grim. She continued to divide the provisions between the two bags she'd found in the apartment. Kat hadn't brought them there by chance. Someone knew this apartment was here, and their safety was limited. She thrust the green backpack into Harper's hands and shouldered the dark blue one. Come on, she said to her bewildered companion. We have to keep moving. Harper pulled the bag onto her shoulders and adjusted the straps. She tried to stop her fingers from trembling. Shouldn't we wait for Kevo? Gemma gave her a look of disbelief and shook her head. You're not thinking clearly. He's with your mother. If he's not already dead, you want him as far away from you as possible. Why? Man, they really taught you nothing, huh? Gemma sighed and ran a hand over her hair. Look, your mom... Isn't she your mom, too? I thought we were sisters, Harper interjected. Half-sisters, but we'll get to that later. 
Gemma was moving toward the door. Listen, I'll tell you everything you want to know, but not here. Not now. Harper started to follow her, but she hesitated. How do I know I can trust you? Gemma rolled her eyes. It's me or your mom. Your choice. Gemma shrugged and walked out the door. Harper looked out the window. The sky was growing dark. She realized she had no idea what time it was, or even what day. The sun was hidden behind thick, dark clouds, and it was getting darker. There was a low, distant rumble of thunder, and Harper shivered violently. Her skin tingled with electricity, and she felt the heavy weight of dread pulling down on her. Gemma stuck her head in the door. Last chance, you coming? Harper cast one last glance out the window and hurried out into the darkness with her sister. And that is the end of Chapter 15, Book Lovers. Thank you so much for listening to my weekly writing project, Heart of the Storm. I hope you're still enjoying it. Thank you so much for listening, and until next time, keep reading.